Uh, in a lot of organic chemistry classes, when we're talking about optical or when we're talking about chirality, you will often see reference to this concept known as optical activity, because it's how we would experimentally determine uh, how much of one chiral atom we have in comparison to another. Okay, um, and we would determine that with our minus and plus system, not our RNS system. So when we go through and look at that kind of system, we've got something known as enantiomeric excess. So we run a reaction, we can say, we have this much in excess of one of those chiral atoms than the other. So we can determine that excess in kind of a simple fashion. We take the percent of the highest percentage enantiomer, whichever one it may be, then we subtract the percentage of the lowest one, and we have the enantiomeric excess. So it's one way to solve for that excess value. The other way, is to go through and use this equation, okay? Because to get those percentages, we have to have some experimental data. The experimental data comes from your optical rotation. And so what we'll do is look at the specific optical rotation. It has to be the specific one because we have to standardize it. We'll look at the optical rotation for our mixture, our unknown mixture, and we'll compare that back to a literature value for one of the pure uh, enantiomers, or one of our pure chiral molecules. Okay, uh, In that ratio, we can then multiply by 100%, turns out that that equals our enantiomeric excess. Okay, so that's kind of a neat little system to use. Where this comes into play is that you will typically be given a question like that shown below. We have the specific rotation, and here I'm telling you the name of the compound, 2s iodobutane, and you're told that it has a plus or positive 15.9 degrees specific rotation. Okay, that's the literature. Uh, if we now take a, a mixture that is now some combination of the enantiomers of this compound, uh, I notice that the specific rotation for that mixture happens to be 3.18 degrees. Okay, so we now want to know the percent composition. So how much of the S, how much of the R is present in this? So a couple things should jump out at you right away. Number one, the S enantiomer had a positive value. Okay, that is not always true, and in fact, most people tend to think that the S is minus. It's completely irrelevant to different systems. So in this case, I picked very specifically an example that goes counter to what we would think to be true because it's a false assumption. Okay. So in this particular case, the S enantiomer rotates in the positive direction. Okay. If we take a look at our mixture, our mixture is rotating in the negative direction, which means which species do we have in excess? We have the R in excess because it's negative, not positive. Okay. I'm assuming we don't have weird stuff going on, so just kind of ignore the weird stuff. So we have an excess of our R. So that's kind of a nice thing that we could look at. So on a multiple choice test, we could go through and say, well, which of my answers shows R as an excess? And if we're lucky, only one of them is R, and that's then my answer, and I don't have to worry about it. The next part. If it was 100% R, it would be negative 15.9 degrees. Okay, the complete opposite of S. That's kind of what opposites mean. Okay. <clears throat> it's not 15.9, it's darn close to zero, it's 3.18. Okay, well why would it be so close to zero? What happens at zero? Well at zero our light comes in, sees the S, rotates 15.9 degrees, sees the R, rotates back 15.9 degrees. So at zero we have a perfect mixture of S and R. So if we're at 3.18, the relative abundance of R versus S those should be pretty darn close to each other. So we're probably not looking at a huge enantiomeric excess here. Okay. <clears throat> After that, we're then really left to do the calculation. Okay. And this is usually where students stumble with the calculation because they're missing some pretty big, I wouldn't necessarily call them obvious, but they're statements that when they're made, you're like, oh yeah, duh. One of which we already mentioned. S and R and plus and minus are opposites. So that means if I know S is uh, plus 15.9, then pure R is negative 15.9. And I have that information directly out of the question. Just by telling me the pure, 
for the S, I know the pure for the R. Okay. The other big assumption that most students tend to miss is this last one. If I take the percent of S and I add that to the percent of R, so instead of doing the subtraction like the intumeric XX asks for, I add them. What should I get as an answer? Okay. Well, there's only two possibilities, so it's going to come out to be 100%. Okay, by definition, and if my computer catches up with me, that other zero should show up here any second. Okay, there it goes. We have 100%. Okay. We now can go through and solve the question with this information. So let's clear that off, and let's go through and attempt to solve. So, our antimeric excess... Since we don't know what the percent of the enantiomers are right now, we can't solve for using this top equation, so we'll have to use solve using this one. The mixture was negative 3.18. The pure, and this is where it can get tricky, was positive 15.9 for the S. Well, I can just deal with getting rid of that minus by instead of looking at the S, looking at the R, and then that sign instead of being positive, becomes negative. Now when I go through and do my calculation, times 100% here, and you're going to have to bear with me, because I didn't actually calculate it. When we do that calculation, we get 20% in antimeric excess. 20% excess of what? Okay, was it the S or the R? Okay, this comes back to how we entered in our value here. Because we entered it in as the R, we already took that into consideration. This is 20% excess of R. If we had left that sign as a positive, what we're then saying is that we're saying we'd get a negative 20% excess of the S, which really just means, well, 20% excess of R. Okay? So, let's work with the kind of easier analysis here. We're saying this is our R. How does this then stack out to get us our amounts of R and S? Okay, remember this is 20% excess, not 20% R. So that then goes through and says, well, I have 20 must equal the percent of my R as the highest enantiomer minus the percent of my S as the lowest enantiomer. Okay, well, that's one equation, two unknowns, short of just guessing and checking. Uh, it's not easy to solve. So what we can do is bring in that last little equation that I said was useful. The percent R plus the percent S must equal 100%, which means I can simplify this out to say R equals 100 minus S. I can take that, solve into my, or substitute into my equation, and instead of having the percent R to begin with, I'd have 100 minus S minus S Okay, and I can then go through, and I'm going to have to erase all this stuff so I can then go through and solve. This will take me to 20 equals 100 minus 2s. I get minus 80 equals minus 2s. I get s equals 40. R, by subbing back in, will then have to equal 60. There's my percent compositions of each of those. Okay. So it's relatively quick algebra once you make some of those big leaps. Uh, and they aren't really big leaps, you just have to realize they're there. And that's the big concepts in that red box. Hopefully that helps you go through and solve these kind of questions. Uh, and with that, I don't have anything else to say.